and welcome mindsetters to this session of Learn Extra Live, looking at grade 10 life science. I'm Ty, and I'm here with Cheryl, who's going to be taking us through today's session. Cheryl, what are we doing today? Hi, everybody. We're just going to do a recap on the environmental studies, and we're just going to do a few possible questions all right, that you might get in some of your papers at the end of the year. Okay, so Cheryl, sure, while you make your way across Thank the you. board, Mindsetters, you know the drill by now. You need to get on the page, www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Chat to me, let me know what you guys are thinking. If you lost it, if you need help, I can't help you if you don't post. It's kind of simple math, although we're doing life science, but you get where I'm going with this. But anyway, make sure you get on the page, talk to me, let me know what you guys are thinking. And hey, enjoy the show. Cheryl, sure, take it away. Thank you, Ty. Well, if you've been following us for the last couple of weeks, you would have noticed that we have emphasized right, ecology or environmental studies. We have looked at all of the ecological factors, biomes, etc. And today, all that we're going to do is we're just going to recap briefly. So we're going to go through the theory part quite quickly, and then we'll just do a couple of questions right, that might help you to answer your questions better. Okay. Remember when you start off with the environmental section, it's again, remember biology is a different language. There's lots of terms that you need to be able to understand. So when we start off looking at ecology, all right, we are looking at and the earth all right, and things that live on the earth. So when we div divide everything up, we're going to look at the biosphere. The biosphere is where we find all living things. Right? And the biosphere not only all right, is made up, it's land, it's the atmosphere, and it's water. So we're going to find in all three of these spheres, we are going to find living things. So that's your first term, the biosphere, all right, which supports all living things. And that is the lithosphere, which is land, that is the hydrosphere, hydro, water, and atmosphere, which is the air. Now, if we carry on, I'm sure you guys, all right, all of you, have looked at something like this. It's the levels of bio, um, biological classification. If you look very carefully, right, you would have noticed some of the things that we have already done throughout the year. So if we look at the flow, you will notice everything ties up nice and neatly together. Right in the beginning of the year, we looked at the cell. Then you, we went on to tissues, all right, where you looked at plant as well as animal tissues. Okay, and then we went on to body systems. You guys have done the heart, all right? You have done the skeleton. So you've all started to look at, at the beginning part, at the lower levels. Ecology takes all of this, all right, and we build onto it. So what have we got? These terms that you need to know, population, remember, a species that can, the same species, same area that can breed freely. And that, for example, you'll see how I've just put in some elephants. Now we take elephants and we add giraffe and we add some buck and we add a lion, all right, a couple of lions, and all of a sudden we've got a community. We've got the whole, all of these animals now are going to interact, all right? And that's going to bring on a whole new dynamic. And there we go. If we look up a little bit, if I go up a little higher, we're looking at an ecosystem. An ecosystem, all right, quite simply, is how these living organisms are going to interact right, with the non-living. Right? How air and water and all of those things are going to have an effect on everything that is living on the planet. Let me go on to the next one. I'm going to start off with a few questions. I'm going to start off with biomes. We started with biomes, we did biomes last week. So I'm going to start off with the question. I think the best way for you, all right, to understand that, have a map. It's nice and simple. If you don't, if you can't photostat one, I'm sure if you just trace it or you draw it. So you need to have a picture in your mind exactly where the areas are. Okay, so I'm using the same map as I used last week, so just that you can have a little bit of continuation. And as you will see, I've labeled each of the different areas. If we look at the first question, the first question asks you to identify. That's the first thing. So you should have a map of the biomes, and you should label. Use different color pen. Try and think of if it's like, if the area is dry, use a brown pen. If the area is nice and grass and greeny, use like a green pen. Try and use colors just to show you, all right, to give you a bit of an idea of the kind of climate that's going to be there. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to label it. That's nice and easy. I'm going to start quickly. Okay, 
Okay, I'm going to use blue. Let's start at number A. Okay, that is going to be your savanna. All right, or what we call bush felt. Remember, that's up in the northern province going into the northern Cape, and that is our bush felt area. Here we go, our grasslands. All right, round about the Gauteng area. Then ask to number C. C and D are sometimes you get them confused, but let's try. Number C is the Namakaru. All right, number D is the Succulent Karu. Okay, and, la and there's two Karu, sorry. All right, this Fane Boss, number E. All right, and our last one is going to be our small, which is our forest pine. So six marks there, nice and easy. All you have to have done is to know your place on the map, right? So when it comes to biomes, biomes, I'm afraid, is study. So you need to have your picture of your map. You need to have labeled all of your biomes. And then you need to put in all the different characteristics. What special kind of plants do I find there? Um, what's the temperature that I'm going to find? Because if I've got a certain temperature and I've got no rain, then certain plants are going to live there. Certain animals are going to live there. So if we carry on to the next slide, you will see, okay, sorry. Here, what we've done, I've asked simple questions. The biomes is not such a difficult. I think sometimes it just comes down to memory. Which biome is the main tourist attraction during spring, all right, where the whole area is covered with flowers? Now, remember I said certain, all right, certain of them show certain characteristics. So what do you think it would be? Which is the one that has those beautiful flowers? And that is going to be your succulent karoo. Because on your map, all right, on your map of your biomes, you should have put there the Macquilan daisies, fahis, all of those that are, are they important, as I said, they're tourist attractions, ecotourism for us. It's important for our country, right? It brings in revenue. So those kind of things are, if you put those little thoughts all around, you're getting yourself a bit of a mind map, and then it's much easier for you to study. If we go to the next question, all right, question number three. Okay, again, which biome includes one of the world's richest floral kingdoms? Okay, we go back to our map on the biomes. Which one? Remember, you've studied which one has got the greatest variety of plant species. Okay, and you should be thinking automatically it's going to be the fane boss. Remember there in the Western Cape, all the lovely proteas and ericas and all of those were at our endemic species of plants. Okay, now we're going to go into the next question. Again, you see, nice, easy questions just to get the ball rolling. Which biome attracts tourists to its many game farms? All right, and here I actually sometimes think you could give a, pos um, a possibility of two. Lots of our game farms are in the grassland area, all right, but there's also that are found in the savanna. All right, if we look at our, our Kruger National Park and all of our, our game for farms, right, some of them are going down to KwaZulu-Natal. So lots of them in the, in definitely in the grasslands, but we do have a few in Savannah. Grasslands would be, for me, your, most, uh, your best answer at that. Now we're going to go on to things like this, all right? Again, now, if you know what different kinds of plants all right, are in certain biomes, then, then we can do the other way. We can give you certain species and ask you to give us which type of, of, um, which type of biome is there. Now, what I've actually done is I've put a few um, pictures in. The reason being, I think very often we say words like protea, okay? And some people right, might not actually know what it looks like. So what I've done all right, to help you is, and if you... You guys, if you're battling or whatever, go and use your phone. Go and use the internet. Just Google up, just so that you can get a picture of what the plant looks like. So, for example, for number A, fahies and quiver trees. And I'm sure, all right, I know my classes, not all of them, all right, they weren't sure exactly what, what, the, what they look like. But if we have a look at a picture, if I had to show you, that is a quiver tree. All of a sudden, if you look at the surroundings, you're going to get, you, start, you should start to um, get a picture of which biome okay, it's going to be. Now, these are the beautiful fahis. So now you're seeing a dryish area, 
all right? Not desert, because there are some succulent plants, but here, the beautiful Namakuland daisies, all right? So again, what, what um, biome do you think it would be? The, the fahis are always a giveaway. That's going to be the succulent, all right, karoo. Okay, yellowwood and stinkwood. Most of you would recognize that as a tree, yellowwood being South Africa's national tree. But I did put a, I did put a picture up here, right? And where do we find really, really big trees? We're going to find them in the forest, okay? So that answer is then going to be in the forest. Okay, the next tree was your mapani and your baobab again. All right, there's our characteristic baobab tree that we know, all right, used, it's sometimes used as Limpopo provinces, all right, used to be the national anthem, um, emblem. So what are we going to put over there? Limpopo province, yes, it's going to be in the savannah. All right, and our last one, proteas, ericas, and reeds. For some of you, again, I'm not so sure if you might know what an erica is, but if we look at the protea again, one of South, Af uh, South Africa's national emblems, you will see it's here, and we know that a fa and then you should know, all right, that the protea is, protea is endemic to the Feinbos area. Okay, so, so far, all right, what we've looked at, right, just simple one mark questions, general knowledge that you should have, all right, been able to study. I'm now going to go on to a diff not difficult question, but a little bit more in depth. Why is there no specific area for wetlands on the map? If we go back to our biome, you noticed we labeled succulent karoo, nama karoo, we all of those ones that we labeled from A through to F, but we didn't put wetlands in. And the reason being, okay, quite simply, wetlands are not found, all right, are not found in a specific place. They're not specific, all right, to a particular area. Okay, sorry, that is not specific to a particular area. If we had to look at the map, all right, wetlands occur, all right, all over the country. Okay, so we, we can't pinpoint a specific area because if we, we had to then, it would be a generalized area. There's a little bit here and there's a little bit there and there's a little bit there. Okay, but that definitely does not mean that it's not important. So if we have to look at the next question, question number seven, okay, again, what three plant species are going to occur there? Then again, you need to know. If you notice, it's very important that you know what plants, especially plant species, are found in this area. Okay? And your three ones always go for the, the obvious, and that is going to be your bulrushes. Okay? And last week, I put all these pictures up. The hot poker. Right? A lovely yellow and red. It almost looks like an aloe. And then my favorite flower, which is an arum lily. Okay, those are the three flowers that are pretty much predominant in those areas. Now, if you notice the next question, all right, six marks. Write a paragraph, okay, write a paragraph where you explain why wetlands are so important. So here for six marks, this actually counts a lot. So you actually now need to know all of your work, especially now on the wetlands. Now, if we were to have a look, why would we, all right, so why are the wetlands so important? Okay, firstly, number one, I'm going to say biodiversity. Okay, now remember, for the first time, we have an area that is mostly water, okay? If I were to go to this slide over here, let me just press it over there, sorry. Let me go, I think they're there. No, they're not. All right. If we have a look at, um, at the areas, you're going to notice that they're all areas, it's water. Wetlands are 
inner land, they are the fresh water, and they are along the coast that's going to be all your salt water. The wetlands are marshes. They are areas of water. There's lots of water. And as I said, biodiversity, if it's got water, it's going to have a whole lot of different kind of plants. And most importantly, for the water, we're going to have a whole lot of animals. All right, fish and all of those kind. So this wetland environment can give rise to a beautiful, all right, great, bi uh, diverse um, environment. Next one, very important. It's a purifier. Okay? When I mean by purifiers, all the water, all right, gets filtered. All the water in, s in the earth, the water table, gets filtered through all right, these wetlands, and they actually take out any kind of poisons or ions, etc., that are in the water. So they're almost like what your liver, all right, is to your body. Very often, the wetlands, that is what they do. All right, those of you who have seen droughts and floods, all right, what do they do? They control the water, the water flow. I know if those of you have seen a flood, all right, even if it's a flash, flash flood, there's lots and lots of water, and then afterwards, what do we see? All of a sudden, we have this subsidence. Where does the water disappear? Yes, it goes into, all right, into the, into the water table, and it's the wetlands that ensure that the drainage, all right, is going to be there. Okay, also, it purifies, it controls the water, all right, um, it's a tourist attraction. All right, if we have a look at it, lots of our, our wetlands, all right, because of the, the predominant bird life that is found there, we're also going to see that it can be part of our ecotourism. So when it comes to the wetlands, even though it hasn't got its huge, big, all right, space on the map, all right, we are, it does have an important role. Okay, back mm. to you, Ty. All right. So mindsetters, I hope you were paying attention because that was a lot of very interesting information. I hope you have your pens and pads out like I always say you should. But for now, do not disappear and stay right here because we'll see you after this break. And welcome back, mindsetters. Hope you had a nice little break. You went to do whatever you had to do. You went to the bathroom. You went to go get something to eat. Whatever you had to do, now you're here. You're focused. You have your pens and pads out and you're ready to make notes. Because we're about to continue with the rest of the show, so I'm going to hand it straight over to Cheryl. Cheryl, take okay. it away. Thank you again, Ty. Okay, we finished with the biomes, and when we were looking at the biomes, just remember a biome is a really big ecosystem. An ecosystem, as I said, they are the, the non-living characteristics and the living characteristics that have a specific relationship with each other. And when we looked at the biome, all of them had very similar, when we look at savannah, and the grasslands, each of them have got their own specific characteristics. We see a specific kind of climate, we see a specific kind of temperature, we see a specific kind of rainfall, which impacts right on what kind of um, animals and birds and plants, etc., are going to, to, be, to live there. Now, again, I've just put this up for you. It's just, just two words that you can st just start triggering off. The components of the ecosystem, I keep on saying non-living and living, now I want to add in the proper biological term for it. So when we talk about a non-living aspect, that is going to be our abiotic factors. Remember, non-living, anti, you're against. So quite simply, they're not living. They cannot reproduce. We are reliant on cycles in nature for them, all right, to be cycled through, to be keep on being renewed. Then on the other hand, we have our, if we have a look over here, these are our biotic, that is our living characteristics. And there we, we break up our biotic um, characters in what we call trophic levels or feeding levels. In other words, we have green plants, which are producers, because they simply make food. Then we're going to have those that consume, that eat the plants. Those are consumers, all right? They are also heterotrophs. Our heterotrophs cannot make food, and they are reliant then on the autotrophs, the producers. All living things then need to die. Right? Once, that, once that has occurred, obviously, you need to be decomposition. You don't just see mounds and mounds of dead animals and whatnot lying all around. Quite simply, their nutrients need to be returned to the earth. So when we look at abiotic, you see I've given you a list over here. These, 
all of these, the temperature, the rainfall, the water supply, the slope, the aspect, even fire, all right, all of these are going to have an effect on these. Okay? These, all right, our abiotic have a large effect on what our biotic is going to look at. Now, I'm going to just, let's start off with a few, all right, possible questions. We're going to start off with this one. This is quite a popular, all right, question, especially when it comes to soil. Now, remember the soil factors, another word for that we use edaphic factors, right? So not always soil, that's edaphic factors. And when we look at soil, I'm sure you would have done this in primary school, you go back to the three kinds of soil that you looked at, loam, clay, and sandy soil. And remember, what, what was the difference between them? The size of the particles. So the bigger they are, the more air space they have, all right, the less water they can retain. And when they're small, 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 they can retain a lot of water, not too much air, right, so they become quite sticky like clay. So our sand is our big, right, our clay is our small, and then we've got our happy medium in the middle, which is usually what most plants are going to grow in, and that is going to be loam. Okay, so now we're going to take what we know, that size of the particles, and we're going to just use it in an experiment. This here is just a multiple choice question, all right? And you, you could ask long questions on this as well. All that it is, it says here, that you put 50 milliliters of water, right? You've got your three soil samples, U, V, and W. Okay, they don't tell you which is which. They each put 50 milliliters of water through, and at the end, they saw how much water drained. Now, you must be thinking, okay, water drainage, which soil, all right, lets a lot of water through, big spaces. You're thinking, okay, this is the most over here. So it's, let me just change the color there quickly. All right, it's going to be sand. Right, and the least amount of water, because we know that clay is small particles and it retains, so this may, must make us all right, the happy medium, the low. So if we had to look at the question, all right, the question is actually quite tricky. It says, which one of the statements below regarding this experiment is correct? Now, if you have a look, the dependent variable is the soil type. So now we're bringing tho those um, little biological skills into play. The dependent. Dependent means, all right, the ones that you, you changed, your results. I don't think, all right, that the water, the soil type was your dependent variable. What did you want to see? How much water, all right, drained through? So your dependent is your water drainage. That is your Okay, that is going to be your dependent. So we know if we go here, okay, no, can't be A, that is false. All right, so U has the highest water holding. No, all right, we look at that there, have a look, let through the most water. Soil W contains the greatest quantity of air. No, all right, those particles are so, so slight, tight together, there's no space for the air. All right, and then the last one, 50 milliliters of water added represents a controlled variable. Yes. What was the, it was an experiment. What was the one thing that you had to make sure each of the, of the tubes got? 50 milliliters of water. If you added different uh, amounts, then your experiment would have been inaccurate. Okay, so even though it's a multiple choice question that sometimes you th think is very easy, multiple choice questions can actually be quite difficult. Here again, if we go back to our first of that diagram that I showed you, I want to know the correct sequence. From the simplest to the most complex. If you skim over the words over here, all right, the first of all, you should notice the simplest is an organism. So what do we know? It's an organism. Then we have population. Then we have, all right, a community and all of those communities make up an ecosystem. So let's start, okay, there I see organism. All right, there I see two. Population, all right, they've each got that because I know those two are incorrect, okay? So I've got those two right, those two are right. Ecosystem, all right, and community. What is the next one? 
community for that. So then I know number C is correct. Okay, nice little play there with the terminology. When we look at, when we do um, the um, abiotic, we, you should have looked at the cycles, water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. Just a nice little quick one here. Okay, what is the greatest role of plants in the water cycle? And we should know, because we have done plants, all right, transpiration. You guys have just come from doing all the plant tissues before you did the skeleton. So from that, doing the process of how plants lose water, all right, transpiration is going to be your answer. Okay, let's have a look at the next question. Okay, the reason I put this question in is I find that physiography, physiographic, is a very new word. All right, light and temperature and air and water, all of you have heard before. But physiographic factors, that's something very different. Now, the question says, all right, if you have a look, study the diagram below which shows physiographic factors of part of an ecosystem and answer the questions that follow. So here, right, the physiographic factors. Now, when we look at the physiographic factors, you, th you need to remember there are three of them. So you need to have, even if you're in your books, you can draw, all right, you should have a, like a slope that looks like this, and you should have the three things, okay? Aspect, aspect, where's the position of the sun? Which north or south facing? Which area gets the best sun? All right, slope. It's gonna make a difference if the slope is nice and gentle, or if the slope is steep. And the last one is altitude. All right, height above sea level. All of these factors, aspect, slope, and altitude, are going to have an effect on A, what plants are going to be there, and B, all right, what animals are going to be there. So aspect places its position according to the sun, slope, gentle or steep slope, and altitude. All right, which brings us to our very first question. List two physiographic factors and briefly state what is meant by each. So here we go, there's three, you can choose any two. So aspect, we know it's a places, okay, position, all right, to the sun. Okay, I'm just writing quickly. Slope, that is going to be gradient, all right, a steep slope you're going to have more runoff, then you're going to have more soil erosion, more soil erosion, all right? You have what's going to happen, not enough, the soil's going to be eroded away, you're going to have very little plant growth, okay? Altitude, that's height above sea level. The higher we go, what happens? Less oxygen there is, okay? Which means that animals have to compensate. What else? It's much windier above, all right, higher we go, much more wind. When it comes to aspect, you will see north and south facing th slopes, all right, in South Africa, our north facing slopes are warmer than our south facing, okay? So the north, that's nice and warm, all right, and our south facing is much cooler. Okay, so now think, this is temperature, cooler, what am I going to find? More water. Okay, let me write here. More water. If I've got more water, what am I going to have? Okay, plants. More plants, like your ferns. If I've got more plants, what am I going to find? Increase in animal biodiversity, also food. All right, so if you northern facing slopes, if they're warm, they're hotter, all right, and drier. So what kind of plants you're going to have there? Your xerophytes. All right, much more adapted to the lack of water. So you'll see, just by the two different slopes, by receiving different amounts of sunlight, will have a great difference on what is over there. So you can choose any of those. Slope, um, altitude, and aspect. Do that. Physiography. It's a place's position on the earth. Physical geography. Physically where it is at. Okay, and these three things are going to have an effect. If we have a look at the next question, okay. Which side of the ecosystem will be the 
coolest. All right, north facing or south, give a reason for your answer. I just went over it just now. In the southern hemisphere, south facing. All right, so what happens is when we talk about, this is a bit confusing. If we talk about north and south, remember north facing, what do you get? Look at all the sunlight. All right, all of the sunlight. So the south is in shade. Okay, you can see. So here is getting all of the heat. This is getting not so much light, not so much heat, so it's going to be cooler. So what's gonna, what are we going to see? The south facing. And the reason is, I'm going to just extend there, okay? It does not, say, not get as much direct sunlight. You will see, sometimes you can use these principles to navigate. So for example, if the south side is cooler, moss might grow on it, right? Which is much more reliant on water. You actually ask your parents, you'll see some of them if they designed their own house, all right? Also designed it so that there's summer, come the sunlight comes in in summer and then winter it is warmer. Okay, let's go on to the next question, all right? Also on physiography, yeah, here we go back to our skills. Draw a table to show one difference between the north and south side of the mountain with reference to water content and vegetation. Okay, so first thing, all right, you should be drawing is a table. We've got two things that we have to look at. First, label it, the north facing side and then the south facing side. Okay, so there we go, one mark already for being able to draw a table. Now they've asked you for two things, okay? Water content. What did we just say just now? The south was cool, okay, and warm. I mean, sorry, wet, apologize. All right, and what was the north? The north was, okay, warm and dry. So let's put that into table. Water content, north, less, Okay, as it is drier, and the south is the opposite. You must compare tomatoes with tomatoes. You can't just say, compare all of a sudden um, the plants. Okay, so water content, okay, more moist, or you can say increase in water. Okay, any of those. There we go, one mark, two marks. There we've got it. Vegetation, north, because, all right, it's much hotter. You could say, yeah. Uh, zero phytic plants or less variety all right or more hardy plants all right more hardy that means they can take the heat much more and here on the south all right um moisture loving plants okay or you can say that all right there's more of a variety because of the the need for moisture, okay? And you'll find here, if we say zero fights, you'll find a lot of your, okay, meso fights, your plants that, all right, just need a certain amount of water, not particularly adapted to really dry or to live in. Okay, are we finished with that? I think so. Uh? You can take a quick ad break before we get into the rest of it, you think? Yes, I think that would be a good idea. Right. So on that note, mindsetters, make sure you check on the page because I'll be uploading those pictures very, very soon for you guys. So make sure you also don't disappear and stick around because we'll see you right after this. And welcome, mindsetters. Hope you had a nice little break there. You went to do whatever you had to do. Now you're back. You're ready. You've got your pens, pads out, and you're going to make some notes. Because, by the way, we actually have a question here. I don't know if you mind me asking. Okay. Mondi wanted to find out, what is the average of the, hi of the high percentage of humus in for soil? Okay. Mondi, we don't have an actual, well we can give numbers, but we just tend to say on a generalization that the higher the humus content, right? Remember the humus that is going to either be feces or it's going to be dead organic matter, plants dying, animals dying. The greater the humus content, the more fertile the soil is going to be because that's going to be able to retain the water. Is that it? Yeah, that's Kay. about all. All right, we're good all to right, go. Let's carry on. All right, guys, the next section we're going to look at quite quickly, all right, is going to be our cycles. And you should have done three cycles other than the oxygen one, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. Now, remember what I said earlier. 
all of these are abiotic factors. They cannot reproduce and make babies, all right? So it's essential that they are circulated throughout the system, used and returned, used and returned. So when you study the cycle, start off at a point. Say, where does it start? Go through the cycle system, and then you need to end at that point again. So remember what I said? It must be used and then it must be returned. So let's have a look at our next question. I just put a simple, it's a simple one, all right? When we come to the, the water, the water cycle, and all I'm going to do is before you, you can, let's just quickly look at the words. So we're looking at one, all right? What happens when water goes up? That's evap, oh, going, sorry, evaporation. All right, then what happens? Okay. What happens to the water forming clouds? What have we got? Condensation. It's all the Asians. All right. What does plants? We've done that just now. Transpiration. Okay. It falls down to the ground. That's precipitation. Okay. And it goes into the ground. There's two words you can use here. Filtration. Or well, those of you coffee lovers, percolation. All right, sounds like a nice little cup of coffee. The only Asian we don't have over here is runoff. Okay, so there we go. Nice and simple, quickly. We've just looked at the water cycle. So if I were to look at the, my questions, which of the following is true? One is evaporation, yes, and four is transpiration. No, we said number four was precipitation. Number B, transpiration. Was number two? No. All right, we already said that it was yes, transpiration, sorry. And three, condensation. So what did we say? There we go. Number two, what have we got? All right, we don't even have to start off because we know that number B is going to be correct there. So we don't have to worry about the rest. Now, when it comes to the cycles, I find the nitrogen cycle to be the more difficult of the cycles. All right, because again... It's, it's involving words and processes that you're not too entirely familiar with. What I've done here is I've put a simple diagram of the nitrogen cycle, and I want you to label okay, the processes 1 through to 7. Okay. Now remember the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen, even though it's the most prolific gas in our atmosphere, we are unable to breathe it in to use it. Okay, so we have to rely on getting our nitrogen, if we go back to your biochemistry section, which we found in, all right, all our proteins. Remember proteins, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. The only way we're going to get that nitrogen is by eating it. Okay, now, if we can't make the nitrogen, there has to be other organisms that can. And the word here for nitrogen must be bacteria. They are going to be your key principles. So let's have a look at the process. Remember what I said to you? Look, it's a cycle. Here it is. It must be used, and then it must be returned. We have the nitrogen. How do we all right, use it? And then we need to get that nitrogen back into the atmosphere again. We can't use it and keep it. Otherwise, it's not going to be a cycle. Okay, let's start with number one. So we start here. Let's start beginning. We've got nitrogen that's in the atmosphere. Now, first question says, free nitrogen is bound by. In other words, how is the nitrogen taken, all right, and what is going to convert it to its usable part? Remember what I said, okay, is back, oh, wrong side of the pen, bacteria. All right, nodule bacteria. Bacteria are going to be right, the, right, um, the main dudes when it comes to the nitrogen cycle. Now, how do, how do plants get it? Right? Plants, what's actually going to happen now? Remember, it's all these funny little words that you need to know. Ultimately, nitrogen, it must be converted to a usable substance, which we call nitrates. 
Okay? And if it's in the form of nitrates, what can plants do? Plants can then absorb the nitrogen. Okay, and what happens? Long comes here as a grass, all full of all right, all the nutrients or these beans or something, and an animal eats it. And what do we see? That nitrogen is taken into the cow, and what do we do? We eat the cow, we eat the sheep, we eat the chicken. All right, and what has that done? That has got protein, meat, and we eat it, and that's how we get our nitrogen. Okay, so here you'll see plants get it by the process of photosynthesis. Animals are going to eat the plants. So now animals produce waste. Here's our number two. How, what is the process called where animals produce urea? All right, and that is called deamination. It's a big word, I know. All right. Oh, sorry. But your body also, that's how, that reduces the yellow of your urine. Is when your body takes amino acids and breaks it down into two groups. One group it keeps, usually on the hips, all right? And the other group it's going to get rid of because it's nitrogen and it's a waste. Now, look at the arrow. What is going to happen here? Okay, have a look. What happens to plants and animals? Plants and animals are going to die. And in that, they are going to return the nutrients to the soil. And that is called decomposition. Hang on, I just want to change something here. I made a bit of a mistake. I want to just, hang on. Okay, use the eraser. I want to change, sorry, I was a bit ahead of myself. This is deamination. All right, okay, number two, urine. Okay, urine, right, that's what we're going to do. The process urine, right, is going to have all of the, all right, the necessary nitrogen in it. Now, if you have a look, anything that dies is going to be ammonia is given off. The bacteria work on it, all right, and that is ammonia. And ammonia will change to a nitrite and will change to nitrates. Now, that just doesn't happen by itself, all right? What is that going to do? This is bacteria that converts it to nitrates that we can use. What do we call that, all right? Nitri, nitrifying bacteria. Any bacteria that converts, all right, that will convert a back, all right, a nitrogen to a nitrate is a nitrifying bacteria. Now, you will notice what has to happen over here, okay? Look, we need to return it back to the atmosphere. So, now we're going to convert nitrate back to nitrogen. So, this now is D nitrifying bacteria. In other words, it does the opposite. Denitrify, it converts it from a nitrate back into the atmosphere. Look what we did. We used it, we took it in, we used it, returned it. Okay, this is what else other than eaten by plants and animals? What is the one factor, right, that produces this, um, this response? Okay, those of you, you would have had lightning. All right, lightning. When lightning strikes the earth, what does it do? It uh, takes the, bac the bacteria, is charged, and also what it changes is nitrogen to nitrates. Okay, so there we go, the nitrogen cycle. Think nice and easy. Nitrogen, all right, into nitrates. Plants and animals use it. They die, return it, and the bacteria is going to return it back to the atmosphere. Okay. The next one that we're going to look at, remember, are the biotic, and these are words that you should be familiar with since primary school. Omnivore, herbivore, carnivore, saprivore, so herbivore only eats grass, carnivore eats meat, omnivore eats both, or scavenger, or a saprivore breaks down the dead, all right, or a scavenger like hyenas and vultures that are very lazy and don't do all the killing work but just want to eat. Very often, all right, these are the two types of questions that you are going to get. Food chain, remember a food chain is showing the transfer of energy from one level to the other. Okay, and remember, 
always. Okay. All right. Okay, so what we will find over here, all right, is um, for the, the arrows are showing the direction in which, okay, in which this, the energy is going to flow. And we put a whole lot of chains together, and I'm sure you guys will recognize the food web. Okay, have a look there. It's a whole lot of food chains that we put together. Far more complex, but we know that nature, all right, biodiversity, the greater amount of variety, the better. So a question that is pretty typical is going to be one of these. All right, first thing they can do is they show you a, a pyramid. I put this one in because generally most of the pyramids that you're going to you get usually look like the standard one. But here we notice the base is a lot thinner and supports a much greater all right, um, um, consumer. So have a look here. Grass cows man. So grass will be more than cows. Okay, so it's not that one, all right? So because the grass one would look like that, then like that, then like that. Tree aphids ladybird. Aha. Tree, one, lots of aphids, lots of ladybird. Plankton and grass, lots at the bottom. Okay, so what are we going to look at? Number B, the tree. Now, this should be for most of you. All right, have a look here. This is going to be the typical kind of question that you are going to be asked. Here, all right, is a food web. And we can ask you any kind of questions. If you'll notice, we're going to see that it is an aquatic food web, something different. So here, what are we showing you? Look at the words, autotroph, het heterotroph. All right, so we know these are going to be your producers. Okay, biotic factors. So these are all your biotic living. Here are all your abiotic factors, sunlight and water. So let's ask, see what kind of questions we can ask. All right, from that. What is the term used to describe the interlinked relationships? All right, what do we call it? All of these relationships, what are they? What is that showing? A food web. There we go. We just said, what does it look like? It's a food web. It's showing all the relationships, the feeding patterns of, even if you've never heard of it before, all right, just by the show of arrows, is going to show you what trophic level eats what the next one above it. Okay, sorry, let me go back over here. It says here, use the information on the diagram to explain why a coral reef can be described as an ecosystem. What did we say an ecosystem is? An ecosystem is the biotic components, okay, the biotic components, okay, and the relationship with the abiotic. Now, if I have a look, all right, if I go back to my table over here, what do I notice? Here's my biotic and what affects them? Here's my abiotic factors, amount of sunlight, amount of water, amount of gases, dissolved minerals, right? So these are going to have an effect on those. Okay, if we go down, explain fully why the sea stars are both secondary and tertiary consumers. Now, go back to your food web. Okay, you are asked about the sea stars. Okay. Now you are, sorry, it was a bit, let me see. Okay, oh, now we bring that down. Let me erase that quickly. Okay. When we ask about the sea stars, we want to know why they are both secondary and tertiary. I want you to have a look over here. Secondary means, what I want to show you, here's phytoplankton, that is the producer. Sponges, primary consumer. First one to eat. Then sea stars, what are they? Secondary on this food chain. But remember, what is a food web? It's a whole, whole lot of interlinking food chains. Now I want you to have a look over here. Zooplankton, all right. Primary, all right. Sea urchin, secondary. And there we go, tertiary. All right, so it all depends its level. All right, is going to depend where it's going to be. Okay, so you see, just from looking at the diagram, 
All right, you can see there, it asks you for another abiotic factor. How about, so you need to think, all right, you need to think. Soil might not be a good one because it's in the ocean. Right, but Ty, I think we are running out of time, am I right? Yeah, I think we're sure, completely out and it just vanished totally, like that. Totally, quick, quick, quick. <laughs> yes. Mm, but yes, mindsetters, I hope you had a fun session. I hope you guys made notes and to add to your notes i've added and i've posted up those pictures so make sure you go to the page and look under grade 10 life science it's going to be there under biodiversity revision but we'll see you next time cheers